It's been seven years, nearly seven years now, uh, since you were convicted. Well, why go public now? Why? What do you want the world to know? The idea of this book, as I write in the book itself, was came out from one of my fellow prisoners. And in prison, you often exchange stories about what your life has been and so on. And he said, you must write a book. I said, OK. I never thought about it, but I said, OK. And uh, then I thought about, why should I write this book? And really, it's not about relitigating the case. It's not about saying, OK, I'm going to rebuild my reputation. It's about saying, here's an interesting journey, an interesting life. And it has its ups and its downs and many lessons along the way. And I also wanted to kind of describe my own life philosophy. I thought people might relate to some of it. Uh, you talk a lot about, in the book, about what you describe as your biggest regret, the idea of not testifying during the trial. Looking back, what do you think you would have done differently? I should have testified. I mean, to me, it's very simple. You know, when I believe I didn't do anything wrong, I had nothing to hide. I should have just said whatever questions they had, I should have answered. And they started with ACC. And I couldn't understand why the lawyers would tell me, no, no, you shouldn't testify. And being a professional consultant myself, I always wanted my clients to listen to me. So I was completely out of my water in this whole field. I, I didn't know why I should or should not testify. I only knew the simple truth that why, why, why shouldn't I? I mean, I have a story to tell. And the, the SEC thing was very early on, but then at the trial, I was going to testify. And in the very end, they wore me down and convinced me I shouldn't. And to me, it was a personal failure. You know, the whole trial had just gone completely different from what I thought it would be. And I just gave up. I want to go back to a couple of moments throughout the book and throughout your journey, and in particular, moments that clearly became part of the prosecutor's argument and, and, and that you refute in the book. But just to talk about the, the moments, if yeah. you will. Um, and there were a couple of what I imagine were heart-dropping moments for you. I remember when you get the phone call uh, and you're in, in the line at the airport uh, finding out about some of this. But I even want to go back even farther back because the, the prosecutor's argument really revolved only around 16 seconds. Yeah. In so many ways, um, between when you got off the phone, uh, the Goldman Sachs board call, and the next phone call you placed, do you remember that day? Do you remember those 16 seconds? I don't remember the 16 seconds per se, but as I say in the book, you know, that day I had every minute scheduled. But often meetings end early or et cetera. And my first instinct, and this has been my habit, it's not just that day, is to call my secretary and say, what calls do I have to make? And I called her and I asked her whether Raj Ratnam had sent the stuff he was supposed to send. She said, no. I said, get me Raj. And this would be a normal pattern. My lawyer, Gary, when he was cross-examining Lloyd Blankfein, asked him about, do you make calls when you, immediately when you get out of board meetings? He said, yes. And then he asked, does it always relate to the, what happened at the board meeting? He said, no. <laughs> so, you know, it's like if you talk about any business executive, they generally, when they get out, they have a free moment to call. So I don't remember, I don't, I don't remember that. This, this 16 seconds was just highlighted. There would be many such 16 seconds in my life. I remember you talking about Gary thinking he had scored some points in that <laughs> yes, moment. Yes, But yes. that you weren't so sure those points were as valuable as he did. Yeah, because, you know, by that time it was a lot more... See, there were many points that 
unfortunately, he should have scored and, in fact, the fact that Lloyd was rehearsed for many, many hours and changed from his uh, deposition to his witness account, um, that's where it made, made a big difference. Like he kept saying, oh, it's my practice to cover financial results. But that board meeting in October had nothing to do with that. It had to do with 10% of the people being fired. And so, you know, it, those are the points that were more, more important, actually. I want to come back to Goldman and, and the board, but I did want to ask you one other thing, which was, it still seems to me that you're not sure you even reached Raj Rajaratnam Raj, that don't, day. Yeah, I don't, you know, four years later, I had no recollection. The only thing I can go by is, you know, two hours later, I actually called Rajaratnam and say. I want to catch up because he's supposed to deliver some documents to me. That was in the morning phone call, which was there. It was in the evidence that I talked to him for 15 minutes saying, I need this information. So I don't know. I don't remember whether I actually talked. Let me ask you uh, about a line in, in, in the book where you say, perhaps I said more than was strictly appropriate for my role as a board member but my motives were to support, not betray, the bank. Raj Ratnam would often ask me, he had, he had prime brokerage accounts with many, when the U.S. banking system was going through all that trouble, he would say, how is Goldman? Because I've got such a big prime brokerage account. He had with Lehman and he had with Goldman, and he also had with Deutsche Bank and with some European banks. And he was seriously considering saying, I should really put it in the European banks because they seemed less distressed. Um, and he, co he called me. I didn't call him that conversation. He called me that morning because he was going to meet Gary Cohn. And he wanted to have a dis real discussion with him. That's why he broached the subject on whether Goldman would buy some institutions. In those days, I'm sure you remember, everybody was talking about different combinations and mergers and so on. And this was a discussion a month ago in the board meeting where we discussed every possible combination. And then it was reported in the press already. So I wasn't trying to give him any insight or insider information. It was more getting him smart. For, and I say that you know, Goldman is a very smart institution. If this makes sense for them to do a deal opportunistically, they will. Do you think, though, having listened to that tape, that you crossed the line? Not really. It was a figure of speech. I said it happened at the board discussion. I should have never said that. I should have, it would have been my opinion. It, it was a figure of speech. It came out. What I was upset about that discussion really is the second part, which was about Anil Kumar. Um, I didn't think, because the information at that time was neither confidential nor insider, nor had any market moving information. So it was like, okay, I, I made a mistake saying this was at a board discussion. I should have never mentioned the board. Had you made other mistakes that you think weren't caught on tape because of the friendship and relationship you had with him? I, I don't think so. I mean, in, in, in mistakes of, I, you know, it's possible we, we would offer, as you discuss, and how is the state of the economy, how are things going or not going, and you know, I would have a perspective, global perspective, and we did often share business prospects, but never any board discussions. You know, one of the big issues in the trial, uh, and really questions about the SEC's motives and, and, and also the motives of, of the Justice Department is that you were never directly compensated by Rajaratnam. How do you think about that issue today? See, if you look at, this is a question I used to tell my lawyers all the time. If you look at, there were 20 plus cases related to Galleon. In every situation, there was a strict quid pro quo. There was a payment by Raj to his informants. How is it that I'm the only person that amongst his group of informants, as alleged by the prosecution, 
has no arrangement, has no payment, never trades anything. I, I just, you know, I kept telling my lawyers, what, you know, how is it that is possible? So, yeah, I, I think it was a very different kind of, there was absolutely zero benefit of any kind. And at that point in time, when the alleged conversation took place, I was furious at him. He had taken money from me. Tell me about your relationship with Raj Rajaratnam, because it seems to it seemed to have changed and evolved over time. I was quite impressed with him because you know here's a guy who, against all odds, had been become revered in the industry as one of the smartest guys. And in fact, I checked with Hank Paulson, who is a dear friend of mine, and Gary Cohn as to what they thought of him. They thought he was fantastic. So now there's a lot of revisionist history, but at that point in time, he was quite the uh, trader. And so I got to know him over time, and then we made this investment together. And then he was part of uh, when we were forming this Voyager uh, fund that was in the beginning, and then when we were forming NSR. And he was a very smart guy. I, I respected him for that. He was very dedicated to his job. Um, but he was very different from me. I mean, we were not friends. I mean, I had, you know, he had never been to my home for dinner, and I'd never been to his home for dinner. Uh, we never did anything really social together. When you look back on this experience, do you think <clears throat> He really was that smart, or do you think he was really just very smart at finding insiders who could give him information? I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much of his track record you would attribute to inside information. I don't know. I cannot say that. But I think he was very smart. That I can say, that he was very smart. But whether it was his results were all because of you know, inside information, or whether it was also because of his smarts. I, I can't pass that. Do you think that he thought about developing relationships with people like yourself, in part in hopes of being able to acquire inside information? I don't In retrospect? So. No, not with me. I, I, I have to say that, you know, he never asked me about any, you know, he might, he might have, he, he did have the habit of saying, Oh, I hear, you know, everybody's losing money or the industry is... You'd make some general statements and you would have a discussion. But he never approached me by saying, Oh, what was the board... How is the board discussions? Or what was going on there? Or nothing like that. He never asked me. Although he did ask a number of other people I saw in the tapes. So was there a moment which, though, you decided you can't trust Raj Rajaratnam? The first moment was when I discovered that he had taken all his equity out without giving me my share. It just was a betrayal. I felt that, you know, here's a guy who is extremely wealthy. I trusted him. I didn't even have a signature. I mean, I, I just gave him the money. I mean, I always trusted people, and I didn't think he would betray me like that. Take me back to the moment when you do get the phone call on your way through the security line at the airport. What happened is that uh, the Goldman lawyer called me and said, um, we have information that your name has come up in the Raj Ratnam case. And I said, in what way? He said, in, you know, some thought that you may have given some information, inside information to him. I said, no, absolutely not. So then I was in the security line, and I'm going. I said, can I call you back? He said, yeah, I call him back. And he said, you know, well, I've got another person with me, and, you know, yours and Goldman's interests might diverge, and I just want to tell you that this is the case, and I suggest you get a lawyer. And at that point, I have no idea what they're talking about. There's nothing, you know, I can remember, nothing I can relate to. And uh, that was the case for a whole year. I never learned anything. I got a lawyer, but I got 
no information on what is it that they are saying or what is it that they are accusing me of, etc. One of the things I did not appreciate was you almost stepped down from the Goldman Sachs board before this ever happened. Yes. So I stepped down actually. And um, this was because they said I was going to be an advisor to KKR. And Lloyd said, no, you can't do both, you have to choose which was a strange comment because almost everybody else on the board had some affiliation with some private equity firm. Um, so I said, OK. Then uh, I thought about it and told him, really, I, I'm going to resign. We had a board meeting where I attended my resignation. And he gave me um, a gift of uh, you know, two cufflinks that were from the Goldman founders. In fact, I'm wearing that cufflink today just for, here's the cufflink that has Goldman and Sachs portraits on it. And uh, so I accepted the cufflinks. Everything was done. Press announcement was drafted. Three days later, I'm in Europe, and they haven't yet released the press, this thing. Then I get a call from John Bryan that said, Who's also on the board. Who's also on the board. He was the lead director. He said, please reconsider your resignation because it's financial turmoil and Lehman is going to go bankrupt. We don't want one of our board members to be resigning. Please reconsider. And, uh, you know, John Bryan was a very dear old friend. And uh, I said, okay, I'll come and see you and we'll talk about it. And he convinced me not to resign. And if I had resigned, and my wife said, absolutely, you should resign. They said, you know, they asked you to choose, you chose. So, you know, that's, that's, that should be the end of it. And, but I went back. And to my great regret that uh, if I had just stayed stuck with my resignation, none of this would have happened. In fact, I, this is interesting, another question about, you talked about Raj. There's a conversation recorded in this same conversation in July when I talked to him about KKR and Goldman. And I asked him, he's a part of the industry, I said, should I, I have to choose. He said, I would resign from the Goldman board. In fact, that's what he said. And if he was a, if I was his source of great inside information for Goldman, why would he advise me to res resign from the Goldman board? What was your relationship like with Lloyd Blankfein? Because you talk about him at different points throughout the book. And I, I'm unclear, even now, how you ultimately feel about him. Look, I mean, I uh, was brought into the Goldman board by Hank Paulson. I didn't know Lloyd very well from before. And, you know, I had an OK relationship with him. But um, it wasn't the same like Hank. You talk in the book about the idea that when you did step down the second time after these accusations were made, that he was going to keep this private and right. that you found out afterwards that he hadn't. Right. What was that like? That was like, I mean, I felt terrible because I had done something against my instinct, which was, I should have said, again, John Bryan convinced me of this. I should have told John Bryan the day before the board meeting. I said, why don't you discuss it in the board? And if the board thinks I should resign, I will resign. In, you know, instead of saying, OK, I'll resign and gave some reason about I'm overcommitted and this thing, which is true, but you know, that's not the reason why I resigned. And Lloyd telling me that you know, we won't, and maybe this will all go away, and you won't have to because there was still no charges. Nobody had said anything. You know, the SEC or the Justice Department hadn't come to me for any questions, nothing. So, and I didn't even know what it was about. I have no idea. So anyway, that was against my instinct, and I said that. And, you know, I only discovered that much later, that he had, he had uh, immediately disclosed that. Did you talk to him at all afterwards? After when? After I resigned? After you resigned? 
No. Did you talk to him at all when he came no. to court? No. Do you remember watching him? What, yes, what were you course. thinking while you were watching him on the stand? You know, I was thinking that it struck me as very odd that the CEO of Goldman would first come and testify. Second, that he had been so thoroughly rehearsed. I mean, we got out in the trial that he had been for days, you know, both the Justice Department and the SEC. And in fact, in the deposition, which was supposed to be SEC, they had rehearsed him. And it was, I saw him threading a fine needle, which was like, oh, I don't remember whether financials were discussed, but it is my practice to do it. Well, this was an extraordinary board meeting about firing people. And all we discussed was that issue. So then to say, oh, it's my practice to discuss financials, thereby implying that I must have discussed financials. I was always curious. Um, what did you think when Warren Buffett, when you heard that Warren Buffett was actually going to invest in the, in the company? I thought it was very shrewd on both Warren's part and Goldman's part. I mean, Goldman didn't need the sort of boost of confidence and, and uh, good housekeeping seal. of. It just ensured that Goldman would be the last institution standing. You talk a lot about your relationship with McKinsey in the book, given that so much of your career and life was about McKinsey. And it seems to me that you have always felt that McKinsey is like family to you. Yes. And so it, it read to me as if there were these moments where you felt that they had betrayed you and even moments where you felt like maybe you had betrayed them. I owe an enormous amount to McKinsey. I was just, I felt that when all this happened, you know, they should, of course, distance themselves from me. I was retired by then. It was, you know, it wasn't like I was in the firm. And all these charges had nothing to do with McKinsey, had nothing to do with any McKinsey clients or any, n nothing at all. And I had 37 years of serving clients before them, and there was never any issue of any kind ever. So I thought it was a little bit, you know, the actions they took were a little draconian from my perspective. When they took your email address away, you write about, no, but you write about the pain of that. Of course. And I the self-identity. I never had any other email address in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they took my office, my secretary away. Uh, I, needed, I needed my secretary more that time than any other time because, you know, when you get such a shock, if your established infrastructure around you just goes away, you're completely lost, even more lost. When you stared at those jurors day after day listening to this testimony, and you said that as you got closer to the final verdict, you thought your chances were not good. Yeah. Did you think that made sense? Meaning, did you say to yourself, if I'm a juror listening to this, it doesn't sound right? No, I wasn't thinking that. I was thinking, what I was thinking was that the prosecution wove very skillfully a story that was believable, but not true. And I didn't testify, that was a problem. The other thing was that they could keep repeating untruths, which is what really bothered me. What bothered me was the prosecution should be in search of the truth. And they knew very well, for example, I'll give you one example that was Galleon International, I had absolutely nothing to do with. I had no ownership, never received any benefit from it, not at all. They knew it. But throughout the trial, they kept putting in things that would insinuate that I had ownership in Galleon International without proving it anywhere. Do you think in retrospect that the prosecutors no knowingly to this very point 
knowingly manipulated evidence or information to convict you? I tell you, in reply to our appeal memo, when I was appealing, their reply is full with, I had ownership, 15% ownership in Galleon International. They would keep repeating this. They have to know, they scombed through my financial records for the last seven years, every, my bank statements, everything. They found absolutely zero evidence of any ownership of Galleon International, any financial benefit, and yet, they would keep claiming that I own 15% of Galleon International. I can only deduce from that this, this is win at any cost. Doesn't matter if I have to lie. What do you think of Preparara today? He has a book coming out. I know. You know, I, I, I don't want to only single out Preet Bharara because I, I have since then, I interviewed about 40 prisoners in, in, in prison and did their case, uh, extensive case studies on, on them. And I can tell you that at least half the cases there was prosecutorial overreach. It's not, Preet is not the only person who does that. It's part of the system. It's all about their winning. It's all about their, their political animals, most of them. It's about establishing a record. You make the case in the book that you think one of the motives for Preparara's case against you, and possibly even Rajaratnam, is that you're Indian and that he was Indian. And this idea that this was a, a demonstration uh, of, of his power and, and, and his take no prisoners approach. I can't say that with certainty. Uh, I think there may have been some. Actually, a, a different case demonstrates more, more of that to me than he went after the Consul General in, of India here in New York for this domestic um, paying, you know, their household help right. less than, you know. There are like 10,000 diplomats and, and uh, embassy people in, in New York and Washington and et cetera, and I can tell you that whatever she did was probably happening in 2,000 other cases. I can't prove it to you, but I think that is true. And he singled out her. And it's not to say that she didn't do something wrong, but this is changed. Cha we, sh we should change the rules rather than when that kind of violation of law happens routinely. There's something wrong with, you know. You also seem to, to highlight the issue um, around the idea that, that Preparara and the Justice Department didn't go after the big fish, meaning the executives from the banks in the aftermath of the financial crisis, but was much more focused on uh, insider trading and other things, things that James Comey famously called the chicken, chicken club. The chicken club. I found it quite extraordinary that we find banks billions of dollars, and yet somebody must have done that. I mean, they're admitting wrongdoing, right? And then if somebody must have done that wrongdoing inside the human beings do that, it doesn't automatically happen. And the buck should stop at the top. So none of the top management in any of our banks did anything wrong. That's what one has to believe if, if you look at the results. So, so they were not responsible for all the thing, suffering that happened to the common person in, 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 in the main street. Everybody the, the, the fines are paid by the shareholders. The top management reaped all the benefits of extraordinary options and, you know, whatever their compensations were, and they did nothing wrong. Is that believable? And so his approach towards looking at insider trading, you think, was? I don't mind whatever his approach to insider trading. The issue is whether, you know, he was there when the financial crimes were done, when the financial crisis was there, certainly right after that. So his obligation, first task, would have been, this has been the most devastating thing for average America, right? Pension funds gone, all kinds of jobs gone. So 
who are you going after? Not that he shouldn't go after <laughs> insider trading, I'm not saying that. But the priorities are misplaced if you can't get to the real culprits of the financial crisis. Do you think, knowing what you know, that there are culprits out there that were not prosecuted? For sure, for sure. Don't you think? This is, this is, this is, this is, this is one of the great questions of our time, yeah. ten, how can ten it be? years later. How can it be when you pay ten billions of dollars in fines, you admit to incorrect procedures, incorrect, you know, fraud, basically, perpetrated on the American people, and say, nobody did it. I'm just going to find some institutions. Let me ask you a completely separate question. Um, and it goes back to McKinsey. Um, McKinsey is in the news these days in a very big way uh, and not for great news. And there seems to be questions about the culture of McKinsey, uh, about the idea of taking on clients and uh, getting involved in situations where there may be conflicts. You've read the headlines over the past couple of years. What have you thought? I think they are being misrepresented by the press. I, I don't, I've read the things and I know how, for example, how the pension fund in McKinsey, which is managed separately, and the firm works, and the separation between the pension fund. And so if I read the articles, I keep saying, I keep seeing kind of exaggerations and misrepresentations that are unfair to McKinsey. Would have you done business with Saudi? Would I have done business with Saudi? Yes, with a lot more safeguards. Now, how, you know, after this recent set of things in Saudi, I don't know. But, you know, I write a story in, McKin in the book about are not working in South Africa mm -hmm. at that time. And I was very proud of the firm for that. Um, I think it would be too far to say we should not work with any totalitarian regimes like, or any monarchies or dictatorships or whatever. If we have the right safeguards and we can do what, you know, th that way I don't know how much of the world would be excluded. Tell us about your first day going to prison. The first thing they do is to put you in solitary because they're testing you for TB. I don't understand why they can't, why we can't just give a certificate from my doctor saying I don't have TB instead of, you know. But anyway, it was, um, it, that, that's a little artificial period for two or three days when you're in solitary confinement while they're testing you. And then you go to the camp, the low security prison part. And I write extensively about it. It was a very, um, you know, it's like a place when you go to a new place and you're discovering about the culture of the place and how this works and how you're supposed to fit into this place. Because I was very different from most of the people there. You referred to yourself as a political prisoner. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I felt it was the times, those times where, you know, many people were suffering, they were angry at the financial system, they were angry at, so I was there at the crosshairs. I had done nothing wrong. So I felt that I was there for no reason at all. It was unfair. It was, I was a political prisoner in the sense that most political prisoners are there unfairly. And um, that's what I felt. You, you've talked about solitary confinement, which I know was tough, but other people look at uh, low security prisons as club fed. Yeah. What do you think of that impression? Not to the one I went. It wasn't club fed, but it wasn't. Um, I think I'd describe there. I, I had a good time there. You know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I had a good time. Um, you got a lot of time to yourself to reflect, to read, and to develop new friends. And I used to as I said in the book, I used to play a lot of games, cards, and Scrabble, and Bridge, and all that. And um, I got very fit. I was, you know, I would walk 10 miles a day and did lots of push-ups and exercises and, you know, learned it very different and met people that I would never have met otherwise. 
You know, I, I took cop copious notes. I would interview my fellow prisoners and for hours together and their stories. It's the most fascinating learning experience. How did, you, how did you turn what most people think of as a terrible negative in life into what sounds like you're describing a positive? Do you think that's about the way you're wired? Is that about... It's a bit the way I'm wired. I, I'll tell you one definite advantage I have, which was that the sentence was relatively small. So I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is not the benefit many people have there. We are grossly over-sentenced people. So 10 years, 15, 20 years. You can't even, you know, think that far. So that's one thing. Second thing was that I had my family visiting every week. And I had my grandkids come every Friday afternoon. They came and visited. And I had 100 visitors come all on my visitors list. I had sufficient financial means to buy. You're restricted, but you know I, I was not struggling for either visitors to come or commissary items I could buy and so on. There are restrictions, but it was so I was comfortable. And um, I tell you, I, I I think in a funny way I've through my life taken myself out of my comfort zone. I mean, whenever I got very comfortable in something, I said, "Got to do something different." This was forced, but it was out of my comfort zone. And it was an extraordinary learning experience. You're still carrying something with you that you carried with you in prison. What's that? Well, it's, um, I used it this morning. I use it every day when I walk on my treadmill. And this is a little old technology MP3 player. And this was my constant companion in prison. I used to go for 10 mile walks. One of my daughters is a musician and a composer and she would send me recommendations and her songs and so on so it has 300 songs and i listen to it today and i do it every day the same 300 songs put it on shuffle when i walk on my treadmill how much did this whole trial and process cost you economically i haven't done the calculation because it doesn't matter so much but um, i ended up paying about 26 million dollars in fees uh, it's probably about 60 million in legal fees, of which much of it was covered by insurance. So maybe I paid 10 million dollars, and uh, I incurred huge opportunity cost for 10 years. You did very well. Can I ask how much you were left with? I, I mean, it's. Not, I mean, my net worth got cut in half. Let's say roughly. And I have enough to live on. That wasn't the driving force in my life, even though lots the prosecutor tried to portray Wall Street greed. I was never part of Wall Street, so. Can we just talk about, you know, so, you, so you, you, you've you gotten out of prison, and one of the things that, that people, that society often says, especially when somebody has been convicted, is not just that somebody did their time, but that they have contrition, that they've been introspective, and that they then admit their guilt, oftentimes. In this case, you're adamant that you're not guilty. How do, how do, you, how do you square those, the, the, those two opposing ideas that society is desperate, I imagine, for you to say that I am guilty? No, you see, that assumes that our justice system is not flawed, that it gets it right every time. I just don't think it's even close. So if you, if you assume that the justice system is not, you know, perfect and they make mistakes, you know, I, why would I, I, I felt I had not done anything. I'm going to fight it till the very end with every bit of energy and strength I have. That's the teaching of a karma yogi. That's the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. You should do what is your duty. And my duty was to fight. And I didn't worry about the outcomes. I lost every, every appeal. There was a moment early on where you referred to the idea of maybe I should have tried to settle the case. Maybe I should have pled guilty to a lesser, uh, to a lot, lesser crime. A lot of my friends advised me of that. You know, this happens commonly in SEC charges. You know, you, you pay a fine and you, nobody admits to. But, but they're really admitting they did something wrong. 
and I felt I didn't do anything wrong. So even if my friends would have suggested it to me, I would not have taken it up. Even if my lawyers had suggested it to me, I wouldn't have taken it up. Uh, we didn't actively pursue a settlement. I didn't want to do that. What's been the reaction to your reemergence since you've been in prison? This book is, uh, you know, will get me back into some public light, but I've led a quiet life after I've come out. I spent a good part of my time with my kids and grandkids, and then I've re-engaged with some of the philanthropic causes I was always very involved in. Another one that I'm definitely going to do a lot more is the reform of the criminal justice system. I'm already involved in a number of organizations that are working on that, and I plan to, now that my book is done, I will plan to spend more time on that, and then more, more time on reflection and perhaps something completely new that I haven't even grasped as yet. You were on the board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The advisory board. As the advisory board. What's your relationship like today with Bill and Melinda Gates? Well, I, I have to say that Bill was one of the most supportive people when all this happened. Uh, first thing was that he just refused to accept my resignation from the advisory board when I resigned from everything. He said, no, you're innocent till you're proven guilty. I'm not accepting it. You know, a month later, he went to India, and the only questions the reporters would ask him is, why is Rajat Gupta still on your advisory board? And when I heard that, I wrote a note to Bill saying, you know, this is distracting from the work of the foundation. Let me resign. When, after my, for my sentencing, before I even asked him, he said, I got word from him saying he'd like, a, like to write a letter on my behalf, which he did. Um, I, um, you know, I hope the relationship is excellent. Um, I have not gone back to him because of one simple reason. I would, I believed in what the foundation did. I was involved in it for many years. If I go back to him, I want to go back to him and saying, Bill, you know, here's something I would like to do that the foundation does, and I want to devote half my time to it or whatever. Um, I don't want to just go to Bill and say, Bill, I'm back, you know, I'm, you know, I'm here. But, you know, it's, it's, he is a very driven person and he's very focused. And if he can contribute to what he's doing, I'll go to him and I hope he will be receptive. But I haven't done that yet. In crises like this, you often learn who your friends are. Yeah, for sure. What was the biggest surprise? Was there somebody who you thought you would stick by you who didn't? The biggest disappointment actually was my partner at New Silk Route who, uh, after I was charged, he was very gracious and he said, you know, I will never profit from your misfortune. And after I was convicted, he completely turned around. That was a very big disappointment. Um, you know, there are others also who could have helped me testify because they knew the facts well, who backed out. But there was, there was Ravi Trehan who backed out. But I think the prosecutors got to him. And I don't know what they right. did to him, but they got to him. Is there anybody that surprised you by sticking by you? That you lots, lots of, lots of people. I mean, I, I don't know that I wouldn't have. I think there's just, you know, too many to name. There were four or five hundred letters in support. Uh, the judge himself commented that he had never in his 30-year career on the bench um, seen anyone with that kind of support coming. So I'm very grateful.